Our guest tonight, Rupert Wyatt, began his career writing and developing feature films for Miramax and working in British television. After creating several short films as the co-founder of the award-winning Picture Farm, Rupert Wyatt made his feature writing and directing debut with The Escapist, a prison escape drama starring the remarkable Brian Cox, Joseph Fiennes, and Homeland's Damian Lewis. The Village Voice, often a tough critic to please, called it a taut thriller that ends on a note of unexpected grace. His next feature film, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, showed that a franchise can reach its creative peak in its seventh installment. Featuring the best motion capture performance to date by Andy Serkis, Rise showed that a blockbuster effects-driven movie can challenge and move its audience while creating empathy for the most unlikely of characters. Caesar might be a CG chimpanzee, but he's completely three-dimensional and human. In Rise, Mr. Wyatt relaunched a 45-year-old franchise and brought CG character animation to an absolutely new creative height. Mr. Wyatt next directed the stirring pilot of the revolutionary war drama Turn before turning his eye towards the battlegrounds of LA's underground gambling scene in tonight's film, The Gambler. Working with a script from Academy Award winning writer William Monaghan, Mr. Wyatt brings the same nuance and same visual control to this character driven drama that he's demonstrated in all of his work. We are very lucky to have the director here with us tonight to talk about his film. Interviewed tonight by Tova Leiter, ladies and gentlemen, Rupert Wyatt. So, um, yeah, I'm old enough to have been here when the first original one was done, and I can't really remember much of it, but... I remember the experience, and I know that the experience of this one is much better. So I think this is even a better movie, so. It's, it's funny, you know, because I never, it, it's so easy to sound dis disingenuous because I never, or, or maybe a little naive, I guess, but I never set out to, can you hear me? Or is it, yeah, okay, good. Um, I never set out, set out to remake the first movie. Uh, and, and fundamentally, I think, and you guys have just seen the film, mm -hmm. is that right? Okay, good. Um, the first film for me was a, uh, a study of addiction and this film has nothing to do with addiction. And so to me, that was the fundamental difference. So. Right. But, now let me ask you. you something. What was plan B if the black didn't turn up? <laughs> you mean at the end? <laughs> What was plan B? I wanted to know. <laughs> well, he, to me, I always, I saw this guy as sort of living his life or living these, uh, these precious last few days um, in a very coded way. Uh, it sounds odd, but th there's this great Alan Delon film, uh, the Melville film, The Samurai, um, based on this notion of a guy who gets to choose the place of his own death. And... Um, I always saw the end as that. He goes into the to the dragon room at the end with this idea that this is the place where he'll either um, go down fighting or he'll come out alive. So right. it's a redemption story, which is, again, why it's not a study of addiction, because obviously yes. we all know addicts don't learn how to beat their demons. They learn how to control them. So that end run, I think if you perceived it as a film about addiction you would see that as a cop-out and i never intended that that's that's him running to something rather than running from something remind me a little bit of like shoot the piano player is that a three four movie yeah yeah a little bit yeah i guess so yeah, yeah. so you where did the love of 70s movies come from i don't know i i love I love fundamentally stories of people who rage against the machine, you know, people that like the parallax view. Yes. Um, all, the, all the President's Men, um, Three Days of the Condor. I, I love those films of kind of lonely men or lonely women, in a way, sort of looking to beat the system. And right. ev everything I've ever done is a guy who's trying to break free from something, whether it be a prison or a, starting a revolution or or this, I guess. Yeah. 
Is it anti-hero? It's not exactly anti-hero. You know, I guess I guess yes. it is. I mean, it, it, this guy is, on paper at least, and possibly on the screen, he's a very unlikable character. Yeah. And and that's a challenge. And some people aren't going to go for this movie as a result of that, obviously. Um, my hope was that we would be interested enough in who he was and the decisions he's making, even though if we could find him infuriating, but just interested. I was just put a movie star with the right, with a thing, and it would work. Well, they have so yeah. much charm. I mean, that they can... he, yeah, Mark's very empathetic, so that helps. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting because... Uh, when I came here in the 70s, studios made those kind of movies all the time, anti-heroes. Yeah. And today, probably the only time they really do it is in television. <laughs> but Yeah, right? very much so, yeah. And it may be in the films a little bit, yes. Because otherwise you have to make everybody so heroic and so... Yeah, I, I, I mean, we could, we could have a whole long conversation about where Hollywood is today, but I think the, for me, the big... The big issue with a lot of mainstream cinema is is your people are telling stories where there are no repercussions, there are no consequences to people's actions. Whereas if you look at films from the seventies, uh, European cinema of the sixties, um, there's real real events play out. Decisions that are made lead to certain and specific consequences that relate to us as human beings. And if you look at mainstream cinema today there are no consequences, or there are very few. There's a great deal of escapism, but but people are, you know, it's it's the rise of the superhero. People are invulnerable, and uh, and I think I think there's a danger to that. You know, you know, the '70s came uh, really as a reaction to <clears throat> over budget, overproduced musicals that kind of tanked. You know what I mean? Like today with the superheroes, uh, basically, I guess in the 60s or there was like the studios did what they're doing today with the superhero, which is basically copied one genre again and again. And, and they all started to like finally fizzle out. Yeah. And so suddenly came new people came in, young generation came in and they start doing their own movies and they were darker and there were more p character pieces and they were anti-hero and young people gravitated to them and other people gravitated and before you know suddenly the head of the studio said we don't understand what they're doing but it's making money people yeah. seem to like it so like go ahead and do it and so on and so yeah forth. yeah no, so let me ask you something um even though you're british you came to united states and then made your movies here, right? And and kind of ending up with the escapist. How? That's usually not the norm. The norm is that everybody makes their movies in their own countries. Then they have a breakthrough film. Then they get invited by Hollywood to come in. Well, no, that's what happened with me. In the in so far as I made my first film in in Dublin and London, um, and I I was living here and up until two thousand, I was sort of. I was in New York in the 90s, um, uh, making short films, writing. I didn't have a visa, I ran out of money. I went back to London. I carried on making shorts. I kind of knew that's where I needed to get my, my career going because there was a foundation there. There's public money in the UK. Um, right. It's, it's, it's not as easy as it seems because it is very much a club. You have to make the right shorts for the right people, get under the right microscope to kind of get that public funding. But I um, I made a short for Film 4 and the UK Film Council. And um, and it, it was with this actor, Brian Cox. And um, he was somebody that I didn't know I'd sent the script to. He was on a kind of hiatus from making, I think it was a Troy or something like that. Um, and he agreed to do it for three days and we got on. It was a really tough shoot. Um, but that was a good thing in the sense that I think he saw that I was committed as a filmmaker and um, could, could kind of pull it off against uh, certain adversities. I mean, it was a tiny movie, but... Um, and so we set about this notion of me writing something for him, and he said, keep it contained. Um, 
and I knew I needed to do something on a, on a budget. Obviously, it was going to be my first film. I'd spent ten years prior to that trying to make other features that had never happened. So I set about this idea of telling a contained story, which made perfect sense to do something there for in a prison. And um, and we then took four years trying to get the money and a lot of pressure from financiers was you got to cast younger, you got to go with Gerard Butler or you right. got to go with and that and that was the that was the challenge for me because it was very much a genre film on one level. But the whole notion of the story and what I wanted to do with it was looking to subvert the genre. But of course, the finances, they don't think like that. No. They think, how are we going to sell this movie? Yes. So they see it for the genre that it is. So the very fact that I wanted to cast an actor in his 60s and who is first and foremost a character actor and an amazing actor, and, mm. and he was attracting this other cast around him, um, I, knew, I knew what I was going to get. I knew I was going to get a character study and be able to explore a character study less of an action film. Um, and we actually got to a place where we weren't getting the money and I was running, I, I was seriously in debt. And um, we had Tim Roth playing one of the parts and he dropped out. And Brian had just made a film called Running With Scissors with Joseph Fiennes and he gave the script to Joe Fiennes. Joe read it, um, we had a meeting and the UK Film Council said, if you get Joe, he's big in Germany, so. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Um, and so the pre-sales will be such that you guys will get the money. Yeah. So I then did a, the most terrifying telephone call of my life because I knew it was all based on him saying yes. Yes. And he kind of ummed and awed about it and said, oh, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and my life changed. So. And I remember that I had a project with Cassian Elwes and he says to me, you got to see this movie, The Escapist, because that director has talent. So I saw the movie and I said, you know, you're right. And then just as we're going to approach you, you got to do um, that planet yeah. of the apes. Yeah. And we said, once again, we spot them and somebody else picks them up. And that was well, it. Well, you know, it's fun because that was I I after the escapist, I was like, I'm going to make another independent. I'm going to do my own thing. And I, I couldn't get the money. I couldn't get it together. Um, and then, yeah, and then Apes came along. I read the script. I was on a list of 50 directors, Catherine Bigelow and Oliver Stone and all these yeah. far bigger directors, all of whom said no way because <laughs> it was a total poison chalice. Nobody wanted to touch it. And they just kept on working their way down the list. <laughs> and, it, and it ended up being between me, uh, a commercial director called um, Frederick Bond, who's subsequently made some features, and and Thomas Alfredson, who just made Let the Right One In. And I think he's amazing, amazing filmmaker. So I thought, I'm never going to get this job. And the exec from Fox called me, and he was a guy that I'd known because I'd had a couple of general meetings with him. And, and he said, oh, we're going to fly Thomas Alfredson out next week for the meeting. So I thought, OK, well, say goodbye to that job. It's not going to happen. <laughs> And then the next day he called and said, we're not going to fly him out. We did a call with him and it didn't work. And I was like, what did he, what did he say? What did he do? And, and he said, I, he talked in metaphors. And, <laughs> and, and that basically to the film studio was like, we don't yeah, want metaphors. Director. No, please. So, no so, metaphors. So I, it could be that he didn't want to do the film. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, they, they, I kept on going through the interview process and, had a very specific idea of the movie that I wanted to make and that aligned with the producer, which was key, obviously. And uh, and so, yeah, they gave me the job. And the rest of history. Suddenly you have a new... You know, I got to see this movie. I'm, uh, we are friends with uh, Chuck Heston's son, Fraser. He's an old friend of ours. And so whenever there's a new ape movie, we go together. I'm going with the original <laughs> to get the stamp of approval. Yeah, And yeah. that movie got the stamp of approval. Oh, great. So That's great. there you go. Terrific. I'm going to open up for the students because there's so many students here and they probably have a lot of questions because I can ask you again and again, but it's for them. My question is, um, what's a good strategy to get uh, your actor to be at their full you know, to work really good, to get the good performance from them. 
so, oh, you mean actually in terms of getting the performance right? Yeah, getting, getting, the, getting the, like the a actor. good strategy, trying to get the perform a good performance from the actor. I don't know. I mean, I think it's so different with every actor. There's, there's. Um, I think, I think the the more time you spend with them beforehand, the better. Um, my experience is, as I'm sure many of you know, I mean, if you when you walk onto a set, you have a thousand and one things to think about. True. And it's very easy to find that the actual, the nuance of the performance, the organic conversation that you can get from working with an actor is very hard to do when you have all of the white noise of the filmmaking around you. So the more time you prepare with the actor, the better, I think. Um, there are some actors that actually love to have a lot of conversation on set. Uh, John Goodman, for example, with The Gambler, hates conversation yes. on set. And um, he doesn't need it, by the way. No, he's he just doesn't so need it, exactly. fucking brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But he he he's one of those people that I think if you act as his mirror, then you're doing the very best job possible as a director because no actor. No matter how good they are, no actor can know what you shot the previous day if they're not there on set. They don't know the tone that you're conveying. They don't know the pace that you're setting. They don't know what the other actor did in the scene that's going to be played out prior to them. So your job as a director, obviously, is to put all of that in front of them. And it might be that that's more helpful before getting to set so that they understand it and they can come into it prepared. Um, but you know, the devil's in the details. So I think some actors love to discuss in great detail their motivation from walking from one end of the room to the other. Others don't care. So it, it, it's different. Right. Thank you. Hey, thank you for coming. Um, Thanks. Well, I think maybe my question is kind of similar, but um, in regards of uh, specifically talking uh, your work on set, when you get to that, I know you uh, do all the preparation before, but by the time you are on set, do you, in your own style, uh, allow actors to improvise? Do you prefer that they can bring something else? Or it's just strictly your clear vision uh, that you had? Or, I mean, how, how far does that line go bef uh, between you allowing the actors to bring something in or it's more like they following your vision mm -hmm. of the project? I, I think it's really important to give them as much freedom as you can. I, there's nothing more exciting than seeing an actor bring something that you never imagined. And I and it's very easy. I mean, especially when you if you're if you're building something from the ground up, which obviously 90 percent of the time you're doing in terms of like you visualize the film before you get to the actual filmmaking process, I'm sure. Well, I, I imagine that if one thinks in the same way that I do, which is you visualize how the scene plays out in your head. You you hear the cadence of the dialogue. You hear or, or, or feel the kind of and see the interaction between the characters in your imagination. And so what happens, the danger of that is, is you then get to the set and the actors do something totally different. <laughs> and And it can be very frustrating if you're so set in your ways because, of course, what you're then trying to do is you're trying to shoehorn the actor's performance into something that you preconceived and that might not be the right way so it's all about i guess finding the essence of what is in your imagination and that could be very different from the specific beats so i think as long as you as long as you're on the same page in terms of what the character's intent in the scene is then i think you should let the actor fly because because otherwise otherwise you're reversing into something okay thank you thank you interesting well, I also want to thank you for coming to talk to us. It's really awesome. Thank so, you. Um, I also have a question about working with actors. Um, a lot, I, I spent last year, the entire year, doing my first year in New York, and I came across like actors that are at different levels or different stages in their careers. There were two scenes in particular. One was the tennis scene where Jessica Lange, Mark Wahlberg, and then there was like a, a the guy that played the, the Emily coach. Cohen, yeah. So there are three different levels in their careers. Jessica Lange obviously is a very seasoned actress, and then there was another scene in the bank with Jessica Lange, the bank teller, and Mark. And I was wondering how you deal with like collaborating with all three of them, because like I would get like say I'm gonna just say it like a diva actor or somebody who wants to like run all of the acting. I mean, how do you balance the actors' dynamics with each other? Uh, <laughs> Did you have that problem in this movie at all? 
Not really. I mean, I can be kind of indiscreet, I guess, because there's only 200 of you here. So, <laughs> But uh, um, it's funny you mentioned the tennis scene because Jessica Lang, who's amazing, and she was she's very fierce as a person. She's she's in a way her strengths are built on insecurities. Like she's quite a nervous actor. And that's not the easiest thing to to deal with, especially this is my third movie. I'm still learning the ropes in many ways. So you're dealing with somebody who has so much experience and so much understanding of the craft, but at the same time has a has a real sense of who they are and what they expect. So that tennis scene, she'd never played tennis in her life. And we put her with a tennis coach some weeks prior, but there's only so much you can do. So that's her first day on set. She didn't know how to play tennis, so that makes her nervous. And of course, when you're shooting a tennis sequence, you don't have the DP right there behind the camera because you got the camera on a crane arm so that she can then hit the ball and you, you don't whack off the crew. So what I didn't think about, and these are all the things I guess you learn, is she didn't have... You know, an actress like that expects to have the DP right up close to her, lighting her properly and doing it in such a way that they're basically having a relationship with her and 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 keeping her happy in many ways. And she was totally exposed. She's out there on the tennis court in the middle of the midday sun with a camera on a crane arm and all of us are 20 yards away not talking to her or or I am. I'm going across to her, but then I'm going back again. So I see her walk off the set and about five minutes later, I had the AD come over and say, basically she called her agent, her agent had called the producer who wasn't on set. The producer had then called the second AD who then came up to the first AD who then walked over to me <laughs> and we're only 20 feet apart and basically said, you got to have a DP up behind that camera. So in that moment, I was like, okay, this is how, you know, th that's dealing with that particular kind of actor and there's nothing wrong with that i'm not being critical in any way because i totally understand where she's coming from but then i have emery cohen who's this 21 year old actor who's terrific but he's just whacking balls that's all he <laughs> you know and so it's just it's just i guess it's just different but um but it's there's there was no there was no issue with the dynamic of working with the three of them um in terms of them all being together it's uh i guess it's just it's just understanding their needs, you know, and uh, and Emery can, as a young actor, can need just as much as Jessica, but it's just a different. It, they convey it in a different way. I guess. Got it. So you have to be like a detective. Yeah, and and <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a diplomat. Yeah, you know? right. it's it's all about making them feel comfortable and making them understand what you want, but without putting them under pressure. Great, great answer. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. It just reminded me on the days as a producer with a dealing with it all day long. Yeah, yeah, no, that, you know, but she's, she was amazing, so it was yeah. great, so yeah. Hi. Hey, how's it no, going? But they learned never to My read. name's actually Nick Wyatt, so I don't oh, meet too go. many Wyatts. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed the movie, and I loved Rise of the Planet of the Apes, so. Thank you. Really cool, but uh, I know a lot of us are young filmmakers about to, you know, move away from school and go out and try and get something done. Do you have any like words of inspiration or advice for people trying to go out and do something with this? <laughs> don't give up, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I left I left university when I was 21. I had written a script. Um, I thought I left, I dropped out. I didn't get my degree. Um, I thought I was gonna make that movie. It was in, I was in Paris, in France. Uh, I was three weeks away from what I thought was filming and it all fell through. Um, and then I made my first film eventually when I was 35. <laughs> and and I think, you know, so it was 14 years, I wow. guess. And ju over the course of that time, I think if you'd asked the 21-year-old me how I would have felt about that, I probably would have had a breakdown. But, uh, but uh, I... I, over the course of that 14 years, I was just always intent on getting to that place of getting the opportunity to make my first film. And, and that was through writing scripts and getting jobs for hire, making short films, being a bike courier, making sandwiches, whatever it was, basically. But, um, but I've, I've seen a lot of people and I know people 
now that you know is are trying to get their first films off the ground and i think one of the dangers is is you can um i went through four projects back to back of my own making that didn't happen and i got to a place where i got increasingly disenchanted and so i started to discard the projects more quickly and it was only on meeting brian cox and in an interesting way because he attached himself to my feature with the escapist it made it harder for me to give up and move on to another project. And I think that was the saving grace. And I guess all I would say is basically, if you if you find a project that you really understand and you're prepared to spend one to six years with to get it made, then stick with it. Don't 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 kind of get your head turned with another idea or another. I just keep on making that one better. Cool. Thank because you. they all take years, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, every I, time I, you I, think I, you move to a project that is easier, it turns out that it takes just exactly. as long. Exactly. It's just as hard. So, yeah. You know. Do you think that today, the difference between when you were 21 and they are, the tools of making a movie today are just so much more accessible and affordable than... In our generation, where you actually, you know, film costs so much and cameras cost so much and developing the film costs so much and lighting costs so much and editing was, you know, it's... Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I was still making short films and I was shooting on film. I made a few on, on, on video. Um, I guess, the, 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 yes, of course, you can probably, on a practical level, do more now. Uh, on smaller budgets with smaller crews, but the big issue I think is is getting the film seen. And and when we made The Escapist, we didn't have a distribution deal. Um, we had a we had a minimum. Actually, sorry, that's that's not right. We had a minimum guarantee, which basically meant a commitment of a certain amount of money from a UK distributor. But we didn't have US distribution, and. Um, there was a big, big difference from my career. My career would be different probably if I hadn't got into Sundance. Um, and we got rejected by Toronto initially. And so everyone was thinking, okay, this is not going to go well. And then, and then um, I forget his name now, but he was, he was a real champion of the film. But the guy who was running Sundance back yes. in 2009. Gilmore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he saw it, gave us a slot. And that's what transformed everything, yeah. and and it gave us it gave us a platform. And even though two people saw it in the cinemas in the U.S., it it, it allowed me into a career here, I guess. It got um, you into that circle. Yeah, and and I think that's and the that difference. Club. You can have great pieces of work sitting on a shelf, but you just got to get them seen, um, and that's the key. So. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm David. I'm Canadian, so I apologize about Toronto. <laughs> um, my, my question is, on behalf of actors here, I'm curious to know if there are any particular traits you really like in your actors. En enthusiasm is so important. Um, I've worked with actors that just don't show up. Um, and I've worked with actors that bring a wealth of ideas. I think, I think the best actors for me are the ones that, understand a kind of uh, a, a sort of an interactive dialogue with the director the one where you know it's it's as important for the director to feel comfortable that they can say something that's stupid as much as the actor if you know what i mean and there are some actors because they come from a place of fear that they put the director in a position that you always have to say the perfect thing and if they don't then the actor will react accordingly mm -hmm. and that can really shift your 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 relationship with your with your especially if it's your lead in how you then you want to be free to explore to try things that you know take two can be the worst idea possible but you want to try it mm -hmm. so that by the time you get to take five it's actually really working and someone like andy circus on apes is is that kind of guy he's the sort of guy that will want to try anything and and want to hear anything from you and 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 then you know, it, it's it's just sort of mutual inspiration. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Hi. Uh, I'm Rodrigo from Brazil. If uh, I'm not mistaken, the, fil um, the film is based off um, the writings of another person, correct? Um, uh, the another script, right? An older one. 
It, yeah, James Toback wrote the original. Um, Bill Monahan, who wrote this one, paid no attention to it. Oh, okay. I was I was actually going to ask about uh, the fleshing out of the character um, of Jim, actually. Right. If there were any real differences between them both. I, I mean, there's 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 similarities. Obviously, he's an English professor. Um, the relationship with the, the 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 family money those those kind of things did um carry through into our film but um but on a fundamental level again it's it, they're very different approaches to to the story which is uh i don't know if you guys know um the book the diceman luke reinhardt anyone heard of this book it's a brilliant book it's a 1970s counterculture book it got banned but basically it's about a guy who decides to remove free will from the uh, from the equation of his life so he starts to roll a dice and he kind of it goes very dark he thinks if i roll a four i'm going to make myself a cup of coffee if i roll a six i'm going to go downstairs and i'm going to murder the gardener and and it it it's it has a kind of fight club sensibility to it um and i i always when i read this script even though i don't feel like i was able to quite bring enough of that to this i love the idea that this guy is using gambling as a way to basically blow up his life and uh every specific choice he makes has has a specific agenda which is i'm going to take that money from my mother and i'm going to blow it in the casino because that way i'm going to destroy my relationship with her so it's less the story of an addict which is what the original was where he has this compulsion to do it and he doesn't want to hurt his mother but he just inadvertently does to this version, which is actually I want to basically destroy my relationship with my mother because I want to start my life again. So basically he just rides out whatever he does. Yeah, I mean, he, he's, he says in the film, oh, I need to get back to zero. I need to start again. I need to wipe the slate clean. And, and I think that there's, a, there's no coincidence that the vacant lot sign at the end is right behind him. Yeah. I was thinking of that, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, my question has to do with acting. Prior to shooting a film, how much time do you spend with the actors and doing what? For example, could you give us an anecdote from this particular film on prior to shooting? You know. Um, this film, I I, I spent I sp most of the time I spent with Mark Wahlberg. Um, And it was really just going through the scenes. This was an interesting one because this one I had very little to do with the script. Um, so I and I and that and that was that was okay because I kind of made a choice. I was like, okay, if I do this film, I want to shoot this script that exists. And there was all sorts of political reasons why that was, and just boring stuff. But basically, I you try and change a script that's greenlit in the studio system. You're you're und you're undoing. Yes. All of the things that everybody around wants yes. to see happen, and it's very hard as a director. And there's there's good reason, therefore, to make your own material for that reason, because you've got to know where the bodies are buried. Um, and I think with a with this, I came at it as a director for hire, and I and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's it's just a different approach to to making films. Um, you're kind of like a you're like a tailor rather than a clothes designer. Basically, you're sort of recutting something that's already shaped um so when i was working with mark it was as much a kind of education for myself to really try to under understand what this script was about so it was just conversations i mean i i don't really like i don't see the value of great I, i'm not mike lee for example who 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 basically stages scenes In, in the way that Sidney Lumet used to do as well. Sidney Lumet used to chalk out on a stage the, 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 the scene and the parameters of the scene and then have the actors basically inhabit that. And there's something great about that. But you've got to have, first of all, you've got to have your actors available before the shoot, which is hard when you've got movie stars. Um, and you've got to have that time as well. And um, I think with, with this situation, it was about being able to get in a room or get in a cafe or hotel, restaurant or whatever and sit with my actors and just talk to them about the world, about who they are, what they want from the scenes, ask them as many questions as possible, just get them thinking. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, my question is, um, you know, we, we all here in film school are, I feel that sometimes we're limited by budget, let's say. We cannot be re really creative because we, we don't have control of, like, we cannot shoot it on an airplane and stuff like that. But my question it has to do with ambition. You say that it's good to never give up. And, uh, for example, I will, next year I'll be shooting a thesis film. And I want to know uh, your advice, if it's good to be ambitious and say, like, you know what, I'll do whatever it takes to make my idea. Or is it smarter to say, like, you know what, I'm limited now. I'll do something a little bit not that ambitious, maybe. I want to know what would you do, like, or did it work to you in the past? Personally, I would go for the ambitious. I would sh I would go for what you what you want to do. Um, there are many different ways to doing that, and budgets, you know, are 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 not always. They shouldn't shouldn't be a limitation um, for obvious reasons. In the sense that you can be so creative with with a small amount, and I was probably the most creative as a filmmaker making the Escapist on a twenty four day schedule. Um, and the limitations that I had in some ways gave certain life to scenes that perhaps if I'd had more time, you know, I, I, I don't think they would have been as effective. Um, and I've worked with crews that have, have I mean, even, even Apes, we had 52 days to shoot Apes, um, which for a film of that scale with motion capture was sort of unheard of. And a lot of the crew who'd worked with Peter Jackson on the Rings trilogy <laughs> were saying this is a 140 day shoot what are we doing and and then over time and initially they were terrified uh, as i was and then interestingly as we built up a momentum because we had no um we had no way to slow down we had to keep shooting um i, I started to hear a lot of people basically say yeah 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 of course when we were shooting the rings trilogy we only had to shoot a page a day and Therefore, everything ground to a halt. So the energy f just flag. Sort of fl yeah, and and I think there's a great deal to be said for limitations and and just you know finding ways to do things that don't require technical technical expertise or or sort of those kind of things that bring so much budget to to um to the project. But um yeah, but keep it. I mean. Uh, Anything that allows you to explore the notion of, of, of human storytelling without having to rely too much on world creation, I think is, is, is the way to go. I mean, you can imply so much and infer so much without having to see stuff, so. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, this is just in, in regards to um, keeping your sanity as a director. Uh, because I <laughs> did my year one film and uh, my first day Murphy's Law was all in there and um, uh, my DP quit at the last minute and so I ended up having to have my AD be my DP so she's doing a dual <laughs> positions and um, in the middle of my shoot uh, my AD gets gets into it with an actor and like all hell breaks loose and <laughs> you know so I'm having to be a cheerleader for my AD slash DP because she says she can't do it anymore have someone else do it yeah I'm like I don't have that option so um, I mean you know I I handled it uh, I didn't go off I didn't go crazy but I felt very alone you know I, I felt like I couldn't talk to anybody I was just by myself, you yeah. know, while trying to keep everyone calm, my actors calm, and and I'll just say my crew was great and my actors were great. They're professional. It's just I just was looking around like who do I talk to, and there was no one to vent to. So how do you keep that balance here without you know just? I talk to my wife again. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Poor, poor, poor wife, you know, <laughs> she's, she bears the brunt of it. She's a sin eater. Um, but, uh, yeah, I hear you, you know, it's, it's, it can be, it's a weird thing being the person that, I, it's funny, everyone, who was it? Some, someone like John Houston or somebody said that being a, being director was like being a, you know, being the dictator of a small country. And it, 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 it is in a funny sort of way. Like I get home from f finishing a film and, 
suddenly no one's making me coffee anymore. And, <laughs> and, and, it, and it takes a little, you know, it's crazy. Like you, you, you end up becoming like Napoleon <laughs> or you can, I mean, that's the thing. And, and I think, I think it, it, as much as you have that autonomy, you can make decisions where, you know, things happen for you. And Brian Singer actually said, uh, even though I wouldn't recommend it, he said, you can direct a film by saying merely yes or no. And, and it's true because you have this wealth of talent around you that just brings you things and says, would you like the costume red or green? And, and <laughs> there's more to it than that, obviously. But, but, uh, um, but I do think that with that, comes a certain alienation or can come an alienation because when then everybody else is sort of moving around you you can find yourself just as sort of the one that everybody is expecting to kind of guide things but ultimately you can find yourself alienated from the actual you know people within your group so i don't know i i would say the more you communicate with everybody on every on every every aspect of the filmmaking process I think the more and 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 this is I guess you know in I'm sort of sorry I'm talking out loud a little bit in terms of how I'm thinking but um, but my experience is the more I get to know everybody and the crews obviously being as big as they are that takes time but the more you're able to share your thoughts and ideas with everybody you know what i mean then the more it's a, it's it brings a sense of collaboration to the process um but at the same time being able to balance that with having a very very clear and exact idea of what you want so that you don't then become undermined by people okay thank so. you thank you very much thanks uh, i just wanted to say congratulations on the film and also i really enjoyed the uh Scene with Mark Wahlberg uh, ranting in the uh, schoolroom, so that was uh, really good. <laughs> really enjoyed that. But uh, my question lies in a specific scene uh, when he goes with the two hundred and sixty thousand to the smaller casino in Arizona, and uh, I feel that you know you're conveying that he's not addicted to gambling. He's just trying to get out of a situation he got into. Yeah. Uh, but in that one scene, you know, you feel that uh, Mark is experiencing the high of gambling, especially in the. Uh, when the shot slides up and then he goes through the low of losing all the money. So is that to falsely lead the audience to believe he is an addict before he reveals he isn't? No, it's not. And, and actually, it's one of the few shots that I replicated from the original. There's a, there's a low angle shot in the original where the lights of the casino create this halo-like effect behind James Kahn's head. And he, he um, hits a three on the 18 and does exactly the same thing that happens in our film, but he plays it like he's God and he plays it like he's the king of the world basically. And, and what we did is, uh, we put a slight move on the shot, but, um, but the way Mark played it was totally, uh, ambivalent. There's no expression in his face because I wanted to convey the idea that he doesn't care. So, so I, yeah, it's interesting you saw it as 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 a high because it wasn't intended as that. Yeah, and I don't think it was the expression of the actor; it was more so the choice of shot. But if I, okay. I didn't see the original, yeah. One, so so may, maybe by me trying to replicate something, I basically <laughs> did the wrong thing. But yeah, <laughs> fair enough. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, my question is in context to what you said earlier. Like you really favor people who rage against the machine, who start a revolution. And I'm guessing you're the same kind of person. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this might be a little controversial, but my, I have two questions. A, have you ever been to a film school? And B, is film school really necessary? <laughs> <laughs> wow. yeah. Well, answer the first question, no. Um, as in, I mean, I, yes, I have. Uh, let me see, have I, have I been through film school? I've done, I've done film courses, but I've not actually uh, done any length of time. I've never done, I read film theory at university. I didn't do practical film. I made short films. That's how I learned. Um, I wish I'd gone to film school. That's, that's all I would say. My, my understanding of lenses is not what it should be. Um, and, and, and I just, the, the, the process of making films, I, I have enough experience from the shorts that I made and understanding of how to work with a crew and understanding what I want. But that all came out of watching movies and, and then making the sort of small films that I could. But I wish I'd been in a group 
with a group of people that all loved the same thing and were all passionate about doing something. And I and I and I I feel in a way I lost that opportunity. So I would say, in some ways, I can't ju- I can't tell you whether you learn a great deal or you don't learn. But I do think the fact that you're actually doing it all together means a That's great a deal. Your success is, I guess, it's not measurable. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think I think you know. Hey, look, Scorsese did all right. Yeah. Tish, you know. So it it's 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 all. I guess it all comes down to the individual. But I think I might be a better filmmaker if I'd gone to film school. As in, I might have a better set of tools. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for coming and talking to us, Mr. White. Thank you. Um, in the film, uh, every time Mark Wahlberg's character makes a bet. He looks at the dealer's eyes, rather, uh, just like in a Western, rather than more at the cards. So I was wondering if you could throw some light on what he was specifically looking at. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk about how you worked with Mark Wahlberg to create this characterization for the gambler. Uh, and uh, one, one more quick thing, uh, how you worked with Andy Serkis and the CG team uh, to create the memorable character of Charlie? Yeah. Um, OK, three questions. So. Um, <laughs> So the first, yeah, the first one basically, I I shot a lot of the gambling scenes like like a western actually. So you you you're on point in terms of, I looked at a lot of spaghetti westerns. I looked at Once Upon a Time in the West. I looked at a lot of the kind of the anticipation of the gunfight, because I didn't want to play out gambling scenes in a visceral way. I didn't want to try and speed ramp cards and make it that kind of. I didn't want to sex it up in the sense that use camera trickery to to tell the story. Um, because gambling is really boring, frankly, as we all know. It's like watching gambling is like watching paint dry. Mm-hmm. So, um, and there's a reason for that, which is you know the emotions are all suppressed. Mm. Poker face. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so. So I thought, where am I going to get the drama from? And it's all in the eyes. It's all in the eye contact. It's all in the silences. The spaces in between, basically. And gunfights are kind of like that. So, so it was <laughs> worth looking at re- westerns as a reference. Um, and then working with Mark um, was sort of very, uh, such a bland answer, but kind of very easy. You know, he's, he's a consummate professional. Um, he did a huge amount of preparation, he has a lot of dialogue, he's in every scene. So he showed up knowing everything about his part. The dialogue um, was seamless. He very rarely flubbed his lines. Um, He's a he's a businessman in the in so far as he's he's always kind of how can I describe that he's always moving he's always shifting like he's on set all the time um, he understands the process of filmmaking he understands his place as an actor and my place as a director which is key because I think a lot of movie stars especially try and inhabit the role of a director as much as their their own role. And he was very hands off on that front, but he's the sort of actor that's very savvy and that he knows if he goes back to his trailer, he's he, me as a director. I'm not getting the input of him as an actor and 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 my producer, frankly. So he was always on set. He was always there if I needed to consult with him or bring him into a conversation with another actor. So by that I mean he was very professional, um, and he's a nice guy. I mean he's a very easygoing, straightforward guy. Um, lives a bizarre existence as a movie star and there was any number of kind of moments where if we were out on a street and he'd be mobbed he's just the same kind of he's he's sort of like a duck where you don't see the feet paddling he's very you know, <laughs> yeah. so so yeah no i had a great time working with him and, and um andy circus uh and mocap was essentially um to put it succinctly it was a little bit like using computer but not knowing how it works <laughs> wondering about what choices you've considered or discarded uh, regarding the way they play the character. Um, you mean with with Mark and yeah. and Jim Bennett? Um, we, I I think we well we kind of worked according to the script. I mean I I wanted to push. I don't know if you guys have seen Network, but um the the Peter Finch character in Network when he when he when he breaks that moment I'm you know I'm mad as hell. I wanted to find that moment in this where he did he did rant and I took it away from the script in the moment in the lecture where he he does that so we were just trying to find the places where we could push the character and bring him out of his shell because that was the challenge with this character he's very introspective 
and very cynical. And I think as an audience, you need to find a way in. And I'm not, I, I say this in all honesty, I'm not sure we quite got there enough. I think, I think we needed more life from the character. Um, but at the time, I was trying to find those places to bring that out. Thank you. I, um, do you find that shooting, like directing a studio feature compared to an indie feature is more creatively freeing or more oppressing? It's different, I guess. It's, it's, um, it's a whole different set of rules. It's the same process, um, same prep, same shoot, same post um, in terms of all the practicalities, but it's a lot more people involved. Um, I think that the big issue for me with studio filmmaking is uh, the wrong amount of time and energy is, is spent on script. And by that I mean there's nothing better than as, a, as an independent filmmaker being able to craft a script with your writer, co-writer, whoever it is, and really understand the, the foundations you're then going to build the film on. Um, and I think the trouble with studio filmmaking a lot of the time is not enough focus is put to story. Um, it's all about the marketing aspects. It's Well, it's not, that's, that's wrong. It's not all about it, but a lot of onus goes on set pieces or, or what they can sell in trailers and um, and and you can find your your narrative becoming undone by that. Um, I, I was in conversations with apes where logically scenes needed to play out at nighttime and I was being told by the studio they have to happen during the day. And I, and I was like, but that makes no sense because this is night. And they said, well, we can't put it in the trailer if it's nighttime because you don't put nighttime shots in TV trailers. And it, it's those kind of things. Really? That has, Why? I didn't know that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. and, and, and I don't think it's entirely true. I think it's just somebody <laughs> making stuff yeah. up. <laughs> I know, I've heard of it. Yeah. It's but crazy. it's those kind of things where you're just going, but logically, and they go, mm. You know what happened so. to me is I did a movie and um, I looked at the trailer, it was a comedy, and I looked at the trailer and everything that we threw out that wasn't in the movie, they put in the trailer. I'm <laughs> like, if it wasn't good enough for the movie, why are you putting it in a trailer? Yeah. And they said, well, because the movie is an R and you can't show in television an R. So, you know, and then I said, well, but what if you do this and then you cut just before the R thing, but at least something from the movie. Yeah. And we had to go and do it, you know, in another way. But I mean, it was just astounding. You look, you sit there and they say, okay, here's our spot. And you look and you say, it's all the shot that are not in the movie. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's so illogical. Sorry, let's yeah. move on. Hi. I was, uh, hi. I was actually very curious about the choices of music in the movie because they were so drastically opposite to each other. And uh -huh. why did you decide to make them so radically uh, diegetic? I didn't really. I mean, I, I, I didn't intend to do that. Um, my choices were based on the, the, the tone and the mood of the particular moment. Um, but also choosing particular artists that represented, to me, the soundtrack playing in Jim's head, which is if he's a guy at the beginning of the film, especially that sees the world as genius or nothing, then um, he would see, I kind of based it on Jack Nicholson's character in Five Easy Pieces, where he has his very sp p particular viewpoint on the world. And, and I, and I like the idea of the fact that he would perceive the Sixto Rodriguez's and the Dinah Washington's and the for me, pulp and those kind of artists as being genius and representing that. So it, it was not intended to make it too eclectic. It was just finding a soundtrack that would be representative of his viewpoint of the world. Thanks. I'm just wondering, with, with regards to the screenwriting aspect, would you say it makes more sense just to do put one genre into a film or TV series, or is it better to mix them up a bit? How do you mean? As in, I have sort of multiple genres like big black comedy action adventure and i don't i don't i don't know i don't really think like that i think i mean i to me it's all about story and and i guess if you can play a story i mean building a story i i do think in terms of cause and effect storytelling even though this isn't this to me doing this film was trying to do something more in more in the vein of filmmakers that i love like hal ashby and more kind of freewheeling sense of storytelling but 
I don't know whether it's how I naturally think of as a storyteller. I love cause and effect storytelling, so it means that I'm probably better suited as a genre filmmaker. Um, that said, I'm never interested in straight down the line genre. I think if you look at great genre filmmakers from Walter Hill to, I don't know, um, what, uh, oh, his name I forget, the guy who directed Drive, um, Refn, Nicholas yeah. winning Refn, you know, he's a terrific genre filmmaker because they're all subverting in a way. They're all looking to essentially focus on character within a genre world. And I, I, I think that's where you can bring out the comedy or the thriller aspects or the, the romanticism, what have you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Actually, I have a um, uh, really uh, quick question. Uh, Mark Wahlberg character, uh, first time met with a uh, character of Goodman in uh, sauna. And uh, that character uh, put like a hat with the sign in Russian like good steam is good for health. For <laughs> me, like for Russian, it has like a double entendre because <coughs> it means like bad steam could be really dangerous. Yeah. Was it done with the specific reason or it's just uh, occasionally? Uh, I'm going to say yes. You know, to be really honest with you, I mean, I, we set it in the Russian, it was a Russian Schwitz um, uh, down on Olympic here. And uh, um, I went for the hat because of the color, because huh. I color coded <laughs> Frank in red. He uses a red telephone, he has a red bag that yeah. he lends Jim the money with. He and has a red, red car. Yeah, it's yeah uh, really exactly. So, so uh, but I didn't know what was written on it. So <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you from uh, Russian audience. Thanks. <laughs> I think I read that you said that there was some kind of um, um, a sequence that basically kind of gave a little bit of context for why he yeah is like he is. Why yeah. has he run into the gambling as a, yeah. a way to run out of his life? And there was very very quickly there was a, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of stuff that I wanted to I I felt we needed to know. Yes. why this man was doing what he was doing. Yes. It wasn't in the script. And so what I did, it was the th one thing that I put into the film in the process of making it that deviated away from the script, which created a backstory. And there were subtle intimations that Bill had put in the script about what had happened to his father, or not what had happened, but the fact that the father was no longer around. And yes. he asked the question of his mother, whatever did happen to dad, which is more of a rhetorical question. So my, my thought was, this is a guy who... You know, and there's a reason why there's a lot of scenes where he's in water, in the bath, the flashback to the young yes. boy, which was a remnant of the flashbacks that I shot. But there was a whole flashback structure that structured the entire movie where you see this young boy um, at a young age living with parents that were very dysfunctional in this very opulent house and timing himself with these sprinklers so already getting into the sense of gambling on things in order to distance himself from real life and then hearing this parent's argument door slam with the mother as she gets in the car and drives away and him going to the swimming pool and seeing something in the pool and this all played out over mm -hmm. chapters him diving into the pool and finding his father's his father's body there and and realizing his father had killed himself and trying to pull his father up to the surface but not being able to and everyone thought it was the most depressing thing ever and and I just I thought it was great because I thought this is a guy who from that moment on is gonna have I mean it certainly makes sense of his relationship with his mother um, it certainly would make sense of him then finding it hard to kind of remain emotionally open to the world and it would set up, to me, a character that goes through that would then start to see the world in black and white, win or yes. lose. Um, that combined with this stills photographic montage where right after John Goodman says, tell me you're not a man, um, I had a 30 second sequence of still photographs, which was kind of inspired by the, um, the scene in the parallax view where, uh, the, um, where Warren Beatty is indoctrinated. Um, but basically, it's just it's it's his whole life in thirty seconds set to Johnny Cash's "Man Comes Around," told with with still images, and for better or for worse, and I'm I'm not going to be judgmental about it because it's the movie is the movie now. But the studio felt on a twofold level they felt that the stills photographic montage was too unusual, um, and they felt that the flashback structure 
was stopping the film and dragging it down. And I, I took them on. I fought them. And what always happens nowadays is, is uh, unless you've got final cut, um, uh, if, if you're working for a, uh, a, a unilateral studio, they'll tell you, no, you can't have it. Um, but if you're working for a, a respectful studio like the one I was with Paramount, what they do is they say, okay, let's test it. Right. And, and may the best man win. And of course, you know, yeah. you test things that are challenging, you're not going to win. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm not going to say I have my personal opinions, but I'm not going to say it would have made it a better movie. But that I, I think, think is... it would have made a better movie because I think that the only thing it was missing a little bit is why a little bit of that, you know, that kind of put it the whole thing together. Yeah. But it's true, and I, I know it's kind of late, but I watched Birdman last night, and I was just... If that tested through the studio and you had a panel of 20 people telling what they feel about it, it never would have really passed mustard, Yeah, you know? And at the end of it, it's really an intriguing film that stays with you the next day. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and I know that's... Believe me, I've been through that process. Let's test it, and you have all those opinions, and at the end, you have to rise about this opinion and do... Yeah, I mean, testing can be a good thing. Five people tell you you're drunk, yeah. you're drunk. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's that kind of... <laughs> it, it, I mean, that's, there, that's the argument of the protesters, but, it, it's, it's, um, but I do think you have to get to a place as a filmmaker, and you have to... I, you know, and, and I'm not being critical, because I had an amazing experience overall working on this film. Um, but I do think it should remain in the hands of the filmmaker to make those choices ultimately because it doesn't make it any less of a commercial movie, I don't think. Right. Um, and I think if you get that critical support, which we haven't really with this movie, we've been, it's quite a binary reaction. We've had some very good reviews and we've had some terrible reviews. Yeah. And, and, and I think if we had perhaps made a few more challenging choices and, and actually got a little bit more critical support, yeah. that can only help. Yeah. I mean, when, when I made Apes, nobody was expecting anything to come out of that movie. Everyone thought we were going to be a dud. Yeah. And it was because of the initial critical reaction that suddenly it took off. Yeah. And, and critics, you know, critics are valid for that reason. Listen, Bonnie and Clyde didn't get the reaction at the beginning, you know, yeah. until the critical thing came out in yeah. England and whatever, and they discovered yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. I can't thank believe you. the movie's out and we're still playing. Anyway, guys, thank thanks. you so much. All right. Thank you.